أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. In our last episode, we spoke about the the early propagation of the message of Islam. We mentioned that the Holy Quran was revealed to the Prophet at the age of 43. He was appointed as a Prophet at the age of 40, but the verses of the Quran Start, uh, they start being revealed to the Prophet at the age of 43. Uh, approximately, uh, you have dozens and dozens of surahs that are revealed in the first five months. A little over 40 surahs are revealed within the first five months. And the Prophet ﷺ is ultimately commanded by Allah to extend the invitation to his uh, extended relatives. So the Prophet ﷺ now is entering into the public domain. He's propagating the message of Islam, the, the message of monotheism in public spaces. Now the question is, what is the response of his community? How do the Quraysh respond to this new movement, to this new religious tradition. Now when we look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an is very clear that history is going to repeat itself in the life of the Prophet. If you look at Surah Sa'd, Surah 38, verse number 14, Allah very explicitly says, إِن كُلٌّ إِلَّا كَذَّبَ الرُّسُلَ فَحَقَّ عِقَابٍ not one of them, not one of the nations before you, O Muhammad. Not one of them, but rejected the messengers. So throughout history, going back to the time of Noah, Ibrahim, Musa, all of these prophets and messengers that invited their people towards God, towards monotheism, they were rejected and they were belied by their people. So here the Qur'an is very clear that, O Muhammad, you will inevitably endure the same rejection that your predecessors endured. So, in kullun illa kathab al-rusula fa Not one of them, but rejected the messengers. But my punishment came justly and inevitably on them. In another verse we read in Surah Ali Imran, فَإِن كَذَّبُوكَ فَقَدْ كُذِّبَ رُسُلٌ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ But if they reject you, so you see the, the early Meccan surahs console the Prophet, remind him that you will face very strong opposition, and this is not anything that is new. But if they reject you, so indeed were rejected before you messengers who came with clear arguments and scriptures and the illuminating book. فَإِن كَذَّبُوكَ فَقَدْ كُذِّبَ رُسُلٌ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ جَاءُوا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ the, the messengers who came before you also had bayinat. They came with clear arguments. They produced miracles. They presented illuminating scriptures. And yet, they were uh, rejected and ridiculed by their people. So, Quraysh opposes the Prophet. And Quraysh really is going to set the tone for how Arabia is going to deal with the Prophet and his religion. You know, they're, they're the most powerful tribe, and other tribes are going to essentially follow their lead. They're going to set the tone. So, when Islam goes public, so you're talking about when the Prophet is 43 years old and about six months. The leaders of Quraysh, they fiercely oppose Islam. Now you may ask, if the Prophet has a reputation for honesty and trustworthiness, if he's a sadiq al-amin, if he's the, the grandson of the, 
the chief of Quraysh, Abdul Muttalib, and now he's the, the nephew of the chief of Quraysh in, uh, in Abu Talib. He comes from a very respected, prestigious family. He's a man of upright character, a man of integrity. He's married to the woman who is known as the princess of Quraysh. What was it about the Prophet and his message that bothered them? Why did Quraysh so fiercely oppose Islam? There are many reasons, and I'm going to go, in this episode, I'll go through 10 main reasons why Quraysh rejected the Prophet. Number, and, and almost all of these reasons are mentioned throughout the Qur'an. So we'll use the Qur'an as a guide to help us understand the reason and the basis for their rejection of Islam. Number one, they, meaning Quraysh, they felt, they, they felt that they could not accept one single God and abandon their many gods. As we've mentioned, Arabia is a polytheistic culture. Allah in the Quran, He, he quotes the, uh, the polytheists, the Quraysh. Surah Sa'd, verse number 5. So this is the reaction of Quraysh to the message of monotheism. أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ Has he reduced our gods to one god? Has he, Muhammad, reduced our gods to one god? This is indeed an odd thing. Now what's, what's fascinating about this and tragic at the same time is the Arabs had a sense of pride that they traced back, they could trace their lineages, their heritage to Ibrahim. They were, they were proud of their affiliation to the, their, the Abrahamic tradition. They saw themselves as the children of Ibrahim. They saw Ibrahim as the patriarch. Now, despite their connection to Ibrahim, the Arabs had great respect for Ibrahim. Now, what's, what's odd here is that his monotheism, the Tawheed of Ibrahim, had been adulterated by idol worship to such an extent that they felt that Muhammad ﷺ was preaching a new and unprecedented message. I mean, you, you can just imagine how much they deviated from the original message of Ibrahim. This is a man who literally gave his life, who put his life in danger for the sake of establishing monotheism. And yet, when Muhammad is preaching monotheism, the message sounds foreign to them. They say, Inna hadha la shay'un ujab. This is something that's ajib, it's strange, it's odd. So, they could not accept one God. They were adamant about the existence of uh, many deities. And this was very strongly related to the way they set up their, their economic uh, system. You know, each tribe had its own idol, and many of them used to house their idols in the Kaaba, and the Kaaba became a, a, you know, a religious destination for them where they would perform Hajj rituals and they would visit their, uh, their god at least one of their gods that would be stored inside of, uh, of the Kaaba. So they had a problem with monotheism itself. They believed that Allah was the creator, but they, they affirmed the existence of intermediaries who managed their, their day-to-day affairs. They felt that God was too high and aloof to engage in the petty matters of of, of human life. So the, the idols were more accessible to them. And they simply felt that to eliminate the idols and believe in this one God is something that is, that is uh, unacceptable to them. 
So they had a problem with monotheism itself. You know, polytheism was just so deeply ingrained in their conscience. Number two, Quraysh felt that they could not accept a newly founded religion and abandon one that has endured so long. In their minds, Islam is a new phenomenon. Islam is new. Our religious tradition, our, polyth our, our polytheistic practices are ancient. And we will not exchange that which is ancient, that which is well established, with something that is new and novel. And this is why you see, brothers and sisters, in the Qur'an there is so much emphasis on Islam's connection with past prophets, especially Ibrahim. And the, the idea here is that Allah doesn't want us to think for a moment that Islam is new. Islam is not new. Islam is Adam. Islam is related to Nuh, Ibrahim. Islam is connected to all of these past prophets. So Islam is not a New Testament. Islam is the final testament after all of these revelations and these scriptures and the teachings of these prophets. In Surah Ali Imran, verse number 68, Allah says, so you have you know, you know, the Jews uh, making claim uh, that they're, cl they're the closest to Ibrahim. The Arabs claim that they are closer to Ibrahim. But here Allah says, Indeed, the most worthy of Abraham, the one who is closest to him, the one who has the greatest claim to him among the people, are those who followed him. If you want to say that you are on the path of Ibrahim, you have to follow him. And this prophet, the most worthy of Abraham among the people are those who followed him and this prophet, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because he is the embodiment of the Abrahamic way. And those who believe in his message, and God is the guardian of the believers. So here you see that there is emphasis in this verse that the Prophet ﷺ, that Muhammad is reviving the Abrahamic way. He's not introducing a new religion. The foundation, the essence of his message is Abrahamic. So this is not a new religion. This is a revival of the ancient teachings of past prophets. Tawheed is not something that's new. The ethical, the moral teachings of Islam were taught by all previous messengers. Now, the, the jurisprudence changes because of time and place, but the essence is the same, and the essence of Islam is rooted in that, in that older tradition. So, the second reason why Quraysh rejects Islam is that they, they saw Islam as a, a new phenomenon. It's a new religion. And they felt that their religious traditions were, were ancient, they were well-established, and they had endured. Number three, they did not want to abandon the culture of their forefathers. And this is explicitly cited in many Qur'anic verses. For instance, in Surah 43, verses 22 and 23, we read, بَلْ قَالُوا إِنَّا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا عَلَىٰ أُمَّةٍ وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ مُهْتَدُونَ They said, again, in response to what the Prophet is teaching, they said, we found our forefathers on a particular path and we shall be guided by their footsteps. وَكَذَلِكَ مَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ فِي قَرْيَةٍ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ إِلَّا قَالَ مُتْرَفُوهَا 
إنا وجدنا آباءنا على أمة وإنا على آثارهم مقتدون Likewise, we never sent a warner to any city, but that the decadent, the rich, the wealthy among them said, we found our forefathers on a particular path, and we shall follow in their footsteps. So this is not only a reason that Quraysh gives to the Prophet. This is the response that every prophet and messenger heard from their people. So you see how how difficult it is to break tradition, to, to, to go against a cultural norm. Every prophet had to deal with this problem. You know, sometimes, you know, when we want to change certain things in our communities and we're met with, you know, the blowback because we're violating a cultural norm, you know, this is something that, you know, even prophets had to face. So, in the minds of Quraysh, number one, the Prophet was undermining their religious teachings. He was, he was challenging something that was accepted by all, that there are, there are other deities. God is the creator, but there are, other, there, are, there are lesser gods who manage the universe. And they also saw him as, so he is undermining their, their religion. He's introducing a new religion, something that's new, while they believe that they are holding on to a tradition that has endured, that is well established. Number three, he's undermining their culture. So, in the minds of Quraysh, Muhammad is not only disrespecting us, converting to Islam is an insult to our forefathers. You have to understand, brothers and sisters, this is a very tribal culture. Who you, who you are is determined by who your father was and who his father was. If Islam is true, that means they have to admit that their forefathers were wrong. And this is too humiliating for them. They couldn't admit that their forefathers were misguided. So this unwillingness to abandon the culture of their forefathers was one of the was one of the strongest factors for their uh, their stubbornness and their rebelliousness. Number four, the fourth reason that the Quraysh rejected and opposed the Prophet was that they feared their position of power. They feared losing their position of power among the Arabs. Now why is this? By challenging the status quo, he was undermining their superiority over other tribes. Now Quraysh saw themselves as the elites. And Muhammad what is he teaching? Inna akramakum atqakum. Now in addition to all of the other theological issues, they're chal- he's challenging their social hierarchy. Quraysh, the Arabs, believed that they were superior to the other tribes. Now the Prophet is saying what? The best of you, among you, in the eyes of God, are the most pious. doesn't matter if you're from Quraysh. Someone who is an Ethiopian slave may be better than you, if they are God-fearing. So again, this was unacceptable to them. So he's undermining their their religious practices. He's undermining their cultural traditions. He's undermining the status of their forefathers, insinuating that they were misguided. And he's also asserting that we are equal to others. So you see how Islam is a theology that is completely breaking down the the social structures in Mecca. So for Quraysh, you know, this this is problematic. This is a catastrophe to equalize us with others on the basis of piety. So this is a world, this is a region of the world where 
your bloodline is the most important thing. The Prophet says, no, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ So they feared losing their position of power among the Arabs. Now, even among the Quraysh, of course, the Prophet is from Quraysh, but as we mentioned, Quraysh is a, is a super tribe, and Quraysh is comprised of various clans. Now, you would think that Quraysh would be proud that, yes, the, pro, the, man, the Prophet of God, the Messenger of God is from among us. But you have to understand that there are clans within Quraysh who felt jealous of Bani Hashim. Now here is a quotation from Abu Jahl, and it seems that this was something that he said to uh, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. <clears throat> Abu Jahl, and, and when you read this, you can, you can feel the deep jealousy and envy that, that many of the Arabs had towards the clan of Hashim, and, and particularly uh, to the Prophet. So Abu Jahl, he says, so when the message goes public, when the, when the Prophet begins to invite his people to Islam in public spaces, Abu Jahl, and this is a conversation that he, that he has with Walid, he says, Wallahi inni la'alamu amma yaqulu haqq. This is interesting. He says, I know what Muhammad says is true. After all, this is As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. They're the ones who gave him this, this title. The, the truthful one and the trustworthy one. The Prophet made sense. He was a man of great character. And he, had, he, was, he was presenting logical arguments. Abu Jahl says, I know what Muhammad says is true. So what's the problem? Walakin, but... So here, here is the problem. وَلَكِنْ يَمْنَعُنِ شَيْءٌ أَنَّ بَنِي قُصَيْ قَالُوا فِينَ الْحِجَابَ He says, however, he says, I admit, what Muhammad says is the truth. However, the children of Qusay, and this is the Prophet's you know, great-great-great-great-grandfather. So the children of Qusay, meaning you know, Bani Hashim, he says, however, the children of Qusay said, we want to be in charge of draping the Kaaba. So among the Quraysh, it was decided that Bani Hashim would be in charge of draping the Kaaba. فَقُلْنَا نَعَمْ So Abu Jahl says, the children of Qusay, meaning the Prophet's family, the descendants of the Prophet are the children of Qusay. He said, they wanted to be in charge of draping the Kaaba, and we conceded, we agreed. ثُمَّ قَالُوا فِينَ السِّقَايَ And then they ثُمَّ قَالُوا فِينَ السِّقَايَ Then they said that we want to be in charge of distributing water among the Hijaj and we conceded. ثُمَّ قَالُوا فِينَ النَّدْوَ And then we said and then they said we want to we want the governing council to be among us. You know, Darul Nadwa was basically this uh town hall where the different clans would come together and they would discuss societal issues and they would make decisions. It was like a city hall. And Beni Hashim was in charge. So Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl is saying that the children of Qusay, meaning the, the, the family of the Prophet, Beni Hashim, they wanted to be in charge of draping the Kaaba, we agreed. They wanted to be in charge of distributing water to the Hijaj, we conceded, we let them do it. They wanted to be in charge of the governing council. We conceded. They wanted to be the ones who hold the banners. We conceded. Then they gave us the duty of feeding the pilgrims. And we became equal. Because feeding the pilgrims is an important job. And that made the rest of us, the rest of the clans, feel equal to the Bani Hashim. ثُمَّ 
قَالُوا مِنَّا نَبِيُّ وَاللَّهِ لَا أَفْعَالُ And after all of this, after all the concessions that we made, and after finally being equalized with them, and that we distribute food to the pilgrims, but now they say the Prophet is from us. So Abu, J- Abu, Abu Jahl is now thinking that Bani Hashim, they, they're, they're in charge of draping the Kaaba. They're in charge of distributing water to the pilgrims. They're, they are in charge of the governing council, Dar al Nadwa. They are the standard bearers. And all of that was fine because we were with them in feeding the pilgrims, and that made us feel like we are equal to them. But now they're claiming Nubuwa, I will never accept. So you see, brothers and sisters, that Abu Jahl's problem was what? He was jealous of the clan of Hashim. He was jealous of Bani Hashim. That in addition to all of their, their accolades, in addition to all of the prestige that they already possess, they get to have a prophet, a messenger of God among them? I don't accept. So he says, no, by God, we shall not accept this. And there's, a, there's an ayah in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again he highlights this element of jealousy. You see, they didn't reject the Prophet on rational grounds. It was ancestral pride, cultural pride, jealousy. It, it, none of it had to do with logic or rationale. A lot, a lot of it was just stubbornness, jealousy, cultural pride, arrogance as we'll get to. So in Surah 43, verses 31 to 32, Allah speaks about this element of jealousy, which was a factor in them opposing the Prophet. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa qalu lawla nuzzila hadha al-Qur'an ala rajulin min al-qariyatayni azim. They said, again, so you, so you see, they don't debate with the Prophet or engage him intellectually. So the Prophet is inviting them towards Islam, inviting them towards monotheism, inviting them towards a more virtuous life. What do they say? Why doesn't this Qur'an come down to a prominent man from one of these two cities? So, so here, now their argument is, okay, we don't have a problem with the message, message per se. Why you, O Muhammad? Why not? Why, why was... Why was this Qur'an not sent down to one of the prominent men of the two cities? Now, the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, they say the prominent men from the two cities were a reference to two wealthy Arabs. The first was in Mecca. So the two cities here, according to the Mufassirin, refer to Mecca and Ta'if. In Mecca, Walid ibn al-Mughira. This man who's known for his, his good looks, he's known for his belonging to a prominent tribe, he's known for his immense wealth and his eloquence. So the Quraysh were wondering that, you know, why wouldn't God choose someone prominent, someone who had worldly prominence, like Walid ibn al-Mughira? Okay, even if it's not Walid, how about a, man, a great man from Ta'if? Like, for example, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. And why were they great? Because they belonged to, to noble families and they were wealthy. They had money. وَقَالُوا لَوْنَا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ They say, why doesn't this Qur'an come down to a prominent man from one of these two cities? And then Allah says, he answers them, Ahum yaqsimuna rahmat rabbik. Do they dare dole out prophethood? You think Nubuwa is up to you, you give it to whoever you want? Nahnu qasamna baynahum ma'ishatahum fil hayat al-dunya wa rafa'na ba'dahum fawqa ba'dhin darajat liyattakhida ba'dhuhum ba'dhan sukhriyan wa rahmatu rabbika khayrun mimma yajma'oon. Do they dare dole out prophethood, which is a mercy from your Lord? 
It is we who have doled out their livelihood in this temporal life and raised some of them over others to degrees so that some may, may take others into their employ. But prophethood, which is a mercy from your Lord, is greater than all that they have amassed. So, number five was the factor of jealousy and envy. They couldn't tolerate that. You know, why Muhammad? Why not one of the, the wealthier Arabs? Now you may ask, wasn't the Prophet wealthy because of Khadija? Again, in their eyes, this was the wealth of Khadija, and you know, you you are not you are not known as a wealthy uh, person. Number six. They felt the security of Mecca would be compromised. And this is mentioned in the Quran in Surah 28, ayah number 57. وَقَالُوا إِنَّ اتَّبِعِ الْهُدَى مَعَكَ نُتَخَطَّفْ مِنْ أَرْضِنَا They said, if we follow this guidance along with you, we shall be expelled from our land. Now, what's the reason why they had the security concern? It's not clear. Maybe they felt that they would, uh, they would earn the wrath of the gods, their, the lesser gods, and they would, you know, they would lose the safety that was, that was provided to them in their minds by the idols. It's not clear, but it's interesting that people who are in power when they feel threatened by a movement, they'll often invoke security concerns. That your message is a security threat. And this is what we see today. That in the name of national security, regional security, they're willing to silence and uh, marginalize anyone. So they say, if we follow this guidance along with you, we shall be expelled from our land. And then Allah, he, he, he presents a rebuttal. Allah says, أَوَلَمْ نُمَكِّنْ لَهُمْ حَرَمًا آمِنًا يُجْبَى إِلَيْهِ ثَمَرَاتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ رِزْقًا مِنْ لَدُنَّا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah says, did we not place them in a safe sanctuary to which all sorts of produce was brought as sustenance from us? But alas, most of them, do not know. So Allah says, look at where you live and yet I have provided for you. Why are you afraid that if you believe in me and you submit to my prophet, your security is going to be jeopardized? Allah says, I was the one who was protecting you all of these years. Even though you were in a desolate land, I was providing for you and caring for you. Again, there are you know multiple verses where the Quraysh, they, they express this security concern if they believe in the Prophet. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا In Surah 29, verse 67, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا جَعَلْنَا حَرَمًا آمِنًا وَيُتَخَطَّفُ النَّاسُ مِنْ حَوْلِهِمْ أَفَبِالْبَاطِلِ يُؤْمِنُونَ وَبِنِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ يَكْفُرُونَ Do they not see that we made a safe sanctuary? While people around them are looted, do they believe in a falsehood and reject the blessing of God? Now, comparatively, Mecca itself was much safer than the outskirts, the other regions. You know, one of the safest places in Arabia was the, the sanctuary of Mecca. So for Quraysh to say that if we accept Muhammad and we, if we believe in him, that it's going to jeopardize the security of Mecca, that there was no evidence for that. There was no rational reason to believe that it would jeopardize the security of Mecca. Number seven, they didn't feel that Muhammad fit the mold of a prophet. And it's interesting that, you know, in Surah Al Furqan, Surah Ayah number seven, or Surah uh, Surah twenty-five, Ayah number seven. They say, "Waqalu ma li hada al-Rasuli yaakul al-ta'ama wa yamshi fil-aswaq." 
لولا أنزل إليه ملك فيكون معه نذيرا They said, what is this messenger? He eats food and walks in the market. Meaning he's human. Why should we believe? So one of the reasons why they reject the Prophet is they say because he's human. What's special about him? He eats food and he walks in the market. So what, what's the alternative? What do you need to believe? Why doesn't an angel come down to him to be a warner alongside him? So they want the Prophet to walk with an angel that they can see. They want Jibra'il to appear. And they want him to be with him all the time. You have to walk alongside him. So the Qur'an's response to the objection that the Prophet doesn't fit the mold of a Prophet, Allah says in the following verse, in, in uh, verse number 20 of the same surah, surah 25, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا إِنَّهُمْ لَيَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشُونَ فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ And we did not send before you, O Muhammad, any of the messengers except that they ate food and walked in the markets. وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بَصِيرًا and we have made some of you people as trial for others. Will you have patience? And ever is your Lord seeing. So Allah says that every prophet before Muhammad was human. It's, so to these Arabs we say that you believe Ibrahim was a prophet of God. Ibrahim was a human being. So why did you accept that human prophet but you don't want to accept Muhammad as a human prophet? Others among the Quraysh said that no, the messenger has to be an angel. So they opposed the Prophet because he was human. Allah in Surah Al-An'am verse number 9 وَلَوْ جَعَلْنَاهُ مَلَكًا لَجَعَلْنَاهُ رَجُلًا And if we had made an, him an angel we would have made him appear as a man. Allah in the Qur'an, He says, hypothetically, if Muhammad was an angel, we would have to make him appear as a man. We're not going to send a prophet who appears as an angel. Because how can you follow him? How can you emulate him? Your next excuse will be, how are we supposed to follow an angel? An angel has a different nature. We need someone who's relatable to us. See, when you want to make excuses, you're always going to find excuses. And if we made him an angel, we would have made him appear as a man. And we would have covered them with that in which they cover themselves. Meaning that he would be a man wearing the clothes that human beings wear. وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ وَلَوْ أَنزَلْنَا مَلَكًا لَقُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ ثُمَّ لَا يُنظَرُونَ Again, they're adamant about God sending an angel as a prophet. Allah responds. He says, so the, 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 the objection here from Quraysh is what? And they say, why was there not sent down to him an angel? Why, why doesn't an angel appear with the Prophet? But if we had sent down an angel, which is a mu'jiza, which is a miracle, the matter would have been decided. Meaning that Allah, He would not have given you a chance to disbelieve. Meaning that you would be more deserving of chastisement if you rejected even after an angel was sent. But if we had sent down an angel, there's no more ambiguity anymore. If we had sent down an angel, the matter would have been decided. The hujjah would have been too strong. Then, then they would not be reprieved. Number eight. They wanted flashy miracles. 
So you see again, many of these, these excuses were repeated throughout history. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 118. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ those who do not know, who don't have ilm, they say, why does God not speak to us? Why does He only talk to you, O Muhammad? O ta'tina ayah, or there come to us a sign. They want a mu'jizah, they want something flashy. And look at what Allah says. كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Thus spoke those before them like their words. Allah says, you, the arguments are the same. The people before you said the same things. تَشَابَهَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ قَدْ بَيَّنَّ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ Allah says, their hearts resemble each other. Even though they lived thousands of years ago, the hearts, the inclinations, the desires, the nature of the human heart, it's very similar. تَشَابَهَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ And even today, the hearts of people are, very, are the same. Technology has changed, medicine is more advanced, but by and large, the hearts of people are the same. The hearts of human beings haven't changed very much. Number nine, they felt, they felt their fate was sealed and that they had no choice but to be pagans. This is interesting because when you read this verse, it seems that the Quraysh believed, at least to some degree, they believed in predestination. They felt that their fate was sealed, that they didn't have a choice, that I am the way that I am. If I believe, that means God you know, uh, ordained that I, I would take this path. And if I reject, it's the will of God. Surah 43, ayah number 20. So you see how the different reasons why the Quraysh rejected the Prophet and opposed him, the verses are scattered throughout the Qur'an. So it's like a puzzle that you have to put together to understand specifically why Quraysh uh, resisted the Prophet. So in Surah 43, ayah number 20, we read, وَقَالُوا لَوْ شَاءَ الرَّحْمَانُ مَا عَبَدْنَاهُمْ مَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْ هُمْ إِلَّا يَخْرُصُونَ They said, if the All-Merciful had wished, and again, this is also interesting that they, they had a con- conception of Ar-Rahman. Right? So they, they believe that Allah is Al-Khaliq, and Ar-Rahmaniya seems that it was a, an attribute that they understood. وَقَالُوا لَوْ شَاءَ الرَّحْمَانُ مَا عَبَدْنَاهُمْ If the All-Merciful, if Ar-Rahman had wished, we wouldn't have worshipped these idols. Meaning the fact that we are worshipping idols means that God has approved it. Because if He didn't approve it means that he should have interfered. He should have prevented us. And the fact that he didn't prevent us means that he wants us to worship. He wants us to worship these idols. مَا لَهُمْ بِذَٰلِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْ هُمْ إِلَّا يَخْرُصُونَ They cannot be certain of this. This is, this, Allah says, this is not based on knowledge. It's not based on, this is based on conjecture. They have no evidence for such a claim. The claim that it's our fate to be idol worshippers. It's our fate to be polytheists. And number 10, and the last but definitely not the least, is the, the element, the factor of arrogance. Takabbur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 37, ayah number 35, He says, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لا إله إلا الله يستكبرون. When they are told that there is no God but Allah, 
they are arrogant. Allah says, يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ One of the main problems of the Quraysh was their arrogance. And you see this even in the conversion story of Abu Sufyan. Even Abu Sufyan, when he you know, supposedly declared his Islam, he comes to the Prophet, and inshallah we'll speak about this in more detail, when we speak about the, the conquest of Mecca, when Mecca was conquered, Abu Sufyan saw that there's nothing we have to surrender. We've lost. I tried relentlessly, tirelessly to extinguish the flame of Islam, but I was not able to. So he's brought to the Prophet. And Rasulullah says to him, Ya Abu Sufyan, Ama ana laka an tashhad an la ilaha illallah. O Abu Sufyan, isn't it not time that you acknowledge, that you affirm that there is no God but Allah? He says, Yes. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. He says, I believe that there is no God but Allah. And then the Prophet says, Ama ana laka an tashhad anni Rasulullah. Isn't it time that you also acknowledge that I am? The messenger of God, he says, O Muhammad, inna fil qalbi minha shay. Amma hadihi, fa inna fil qalbi minha shay. As for the second testimony, there is something in my heart that prevents it. It's too arrogant to admit that someone from Bani Hashim is the messenger of God. It's a combination of, of arrogance and jealousy. And we'll see this throughout the the life of the Prophet, throughout the seerah of the Prophet, when you see various personalities resisting and opposing the Prophet, you can look back at these 10 reasons and you can see which reason is is manifesting in their uh, rejection of the Prophet. Inshallah, in our next episode, we'll look at uh, some of the the tactics that the Quraysh used to undermine the Prophet, how they actually tormented the early Muslims and will draw inspiration from the patience and the resilience of the early Muslim community. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. And I look forward to having you join me uh, in another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum Shaykh. Alaikum Um uh, when the story that Abu Jahl uh, was giving what exactly does it mean uh, when Bani Hashim was saying the banner should be in our hands? It's not clear. I, I couldn't find. I tried to look for the answer to that, but it could be it could be two things. It could be in times of war, because that's typically when you have a banner raised, or it could be uh, during the Hajj, where you know banners are raised so people know exactly who to go to for. Uh, for the uh, you know who are basically the custodians of the uh, of the Kaaba, but it seems that this is perhaps in the event of war or battle they would they would be the the standard bearers, and Allah knows best. But it it definitely seems to be an important uh, responsibility, a prestigious role, you know, for Abu Jahl to bring that up in his frustration about Nubuwa also belonging to uh, the children of Qusay. That seems the most likely uh, reason, uh, the most likely uh, role that would be associated with. Uh, just a comment. It, it was interesting that the the attacks against the prophet started so quickly, he, and he wasn't just dismissed as a crackpot or someone who was just like saying silly stuff. He was taken very seriously from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, he was definitely, I mean, you, it, as we mentioned, even before he makes his message public, if you recall during the 
the three years before Quran was even revealed, he him, the Prophet was prevented from praying. You know when, when the so the Prophet used to pray in public. And he was ridiculed for ruku' and sujood. You know, So very early on, even before the revelation of the Quran, uh, people were, they saw the potential threat of this monotheistic tradition. And of course, the, uh, the aggression intensified, uh, you know, in the, in the coming years. And, and we, we'll see this progression of, you know, verbal assault, physical assault, assassination attempt, hijra, and then you have the the successive uh, battles. Oh, they, I mean, they took they took the prophet very seriously, and and we'll we'll look at exactly what they did, how what they did to try to uh, eliminate and mitigate uh, this new problem that they they uh, they saw in Mecca. surprising about them taking the prophet seriously like how, how long how many followers did he have at that time when they considered him a threat that they seemed to consider him a threat even when he had very few followers if i understand correctly yeah yeah he he, he didn't have i mean you have to remember that in the when the prophet went on hijra he had maybe 200 i don't know the exact figure but it it couldn't have been more than a couple of hundred people and this is, you know, you're talking about, you know, 12, 13 years after the Ba'tha. We're talking, you know, this is, the, this is like the thir- three and a half years after Ba'tha. You can imagine that there are no more, I, I can imagine at this phase, there are no more than a couple dozen, two, you know, two, three dozen uh, companions maximum. But, they see the prophet as someone who is who has a huge influence and they also see that the prophet is he's attracting poor people but he's also he's also attracting some people who are not poor who are influential and and we'll see you know later on uh with with the conversion of of other people you'll see that islam is strengthened you know for for example, when Hamza, uh, offic- you know, officially, formally accepts Islam, uh, you see that some members of Quraysh are a lot more careful about how they, how they treat uh, the Muslims. Of course, there is aggression and abuse, but there are some prominent people now that are coming into the fold of Islam, and, and Hamza is definitely one of them. And of course, you have Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, who's who's a teenager, and he's uh, he's he's very physical with people who try to hurt the Prophet. You know, he he gets into uh, into quarrels and fights, street fights with people who uh, who try to bring harm to the Prophet. So, Imam Ali alayhi salam, in you know, as a teenager in the early years of Islam, he he went to blows with people who tried to hurt the Prophet. I mean, there was a lot of street fighting. Uh, in the early days of Islam, of course, defensive. So the, Imam Ali alayhi salam, as a teenager, was essentially the Prophet's bodyguard. And we'll and we'll speak more about this inshallah in the upcoming sessions. Alaikum <laughs> assalam. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you abundantly, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, when uh, during uh, the conquest of Mecca, Fatah Mecca, as you mentioned, the message of Islam went uh, along with his uh, entourage. When he entered uh, Mecca, and then when he told Abu Sufyan, is it the time uh, for you to give Shahada? Uh, and then he did. And he said yes, and he did. And then after that, uh, the message of Islam told uh, Quraysh, the Meccans, that uh, those who take refuge in Abu Sufyan's house, they will be safe. 
and then uh, in Ziyarat uh, al-Ashura, we say Barakullahi ala Abu Sufyan. So, uh, the, uh, can please uh, shed some light on it? Now that, that's that's a good question. There there is no contradiction between the the two statements. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he when he entered Mecca, you have to understand that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of the the qualities of a true leader of a dignified leader is that they they have mercy upon prominent people who are defeated. It's very important. The Prophet ﷺ is not one to pour salt in someone's wound. Abu Sufyan is now experiencing the most humiliating moment in his life. He's been tirelessly fighting the Prophet for years. Now, there, there's, there's a proverb that says, Have mercy upon a prominent person who has been humiliated. So, because Abu Sufyan is a person of high social status, the Prophet, to soften his heart, he acknowledges him. So when the Prophet says, whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe, that's the Prophet's way of, you know, showing him a little bit of, you know, recognition in the hopes that it would soften his heart. And this is one of the reasons why one of the recipients of zakat is those whose hearts may be inclined towards Islam. This is why the Prophet used to give large amounts of zakat to, to the Umayyads. Not because Umayyads are good, but perhaps because maybe if he gives them money and he, he shows them generosity, it will soften their hearts to Islam. It will make them you know, less combative. It will at least, you know, curb their aggression towards Islam and the Muslims. So for, when the Prophet conquers Mecca, the fact that he makes it a point of mentioning that those who go in the house of Abu Sufyan are protected. That was the way, a way of the Prophet kind of showing him a little bit of uh, recognition in hopes of, of softening his heart. The Prophet is not going to, you know, enter Mecca and, and make a and publicly humiliate Abu Sufyan. He's already achieved victory, and if he can, and this shows you how the Prophet did everything in his power to make them feel, to, to ensure that they're treated with, with, with human dignity, so they have no excuse for not accepting Islam. You know, so if the Prophet entered Mecca and did not even acknowledge Abu Sufyan, he would have taken this as an insult. But the fact that the Prophet acknowledged him gives him no reason to, to hold, harbor any malice or resentment toward the Prophet. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Beautiful explanation. Jazakum Allah. Yeah, but only thing is, Ziyarat Ashura, when you say Lana, so next time, whenever you come When we say Lana, see, we have to understand that Abu Sufyan may have recited the Shahada, but if you look at his behavior, this is someone who continued to wage war against Islam and the Muslims. So the, when, we, when we send la'na upon him, we ask Allah to remove his rahmah from Abu Sufyan because even though Abu Sufyan may have, even though he formally accepted Islam, he's considered one of the munafiqeen because of his continual efforts to undermine the Prophet's family, and even after the, uh, when, when uh, Uthman ibn Affan becomes the Khalifa, Abu Sufyan goes to the grave of Hamza and he kicks the grave of Hamza and says that we, we fought with each other, but you know, it was all in vain because now the Khilafah is with us. After the, the death of the Prophet Abu Sufyan, when he sees that Abu Bakr is the Khalifa, Abu Bakr, he's... He goes to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, who is this Abu Bakr? You are more, let us join forces and fight Abu Bakr. But Imam Amir al-Mu'mini knew that Abu Sufyan doesn't have pure intentions. This is a man who does not have the best interests of Islam in mind. He's only looking out for one person and that's himself and the Umayyads. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Sheikh. Ahsan Barakallah fikum. And inshallah, we will. Any more questions or comments? Uh, one, one more question, Sheikh. Yes. So, uh, on point five, there's a interesting verse that you mentioned, like Quran, uh, the verse, uh, Surah 43, verse 32. Yeah. Talks about uh, we raise others in degrees so that they may take others into their employ. So, this almost sounds like it's implying that the responsibility of like the wealthy is job creation or something along those lines. Yeah, so, so this verse is speaking about the, 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 the distribution of rizq. Allah gives people more, some, Allah gives some people more sustenance than others. So, and, and, and one of the reasons why He does this is to allow us to employ others. And this is also a trial for us. How are we going to treat others who depend on us financially? How are you going to act as an employer? Allah has placed the rizq of others in your hands. Are you going to distribute it to them in a way that is fair, in a way that is equi uh, equitable? So when Allah says, and raise some of them over others to degrees, so that some may take others into their employ, you know, this is, and this is why it's, it's so recommended in the Islamic tradition to be your own boss so you can potentially uh, hire other people and employ them. So, one of the benefits of being wealthy is that you have it's encouraged that you that you create jobs uh, for others. Thank you very much, Shia. Ahsan Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next week. Bi'idhnillah. Assalamu alaikum.